Oh, Half Moon Bay is very nice. Sorry. You're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another meetup of Digital Rebar Provision. Today's meetup version number 018 uh, has a fantastic set of items to cover. We're going to cover secure parameters, which is very exciting. It's uh, bringing in some very cool uh, enterprise capability solutions to be able to uh, inject parameter values into the digital rebar provisioning content uh, that are encrypted, so they're not uh, exposed within the content itself. And there's a whole bunch of interesting things that we'll be doing with that going forward today uh victor lowther from racken will be giving us a discussion overview and a quick demo of the secure parameters those exist in tip today so anyone interested in looking at playing with it will need a pull tip to uh, get to those um, and today we're also going to talk about uh, the web ux uh, ui components for the tenant features or the role-based access controls capabilities pieces uh, Greg Altos has put together some of the UX components, which are uh, also in our UX tip uh, element. And I think there'll be some more work on that going forward in the future. And then we're going to do everybody's most favorite and exciting thing. We're going to go do some bug scrub uh, if there's some time towards the end. We have a number of enhancements and features that have been filed and issues, et cetera, uh, that have been closed. And we want to get those issues closed out. Uh, so the community issues list reflects all of that. Um, I was so excited to jump in today's uh, uh, agenda that I forgot to introduce everybody. Uh, I'm Shane Gibson with Racken. We have on the Racken team, we have Rob Hirschfeld, Steven Spector, Greg Althaus, and Victor Lowther on board with us. And we have a great representation from the community today. Uh, we've got a number of folks from community on board. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, with that said, uh, Victor, are you ready to show us some fancy uh, parameters secure business? Sure, why not is what he said. <laughs> right. Uh, so the sharing uh, is all yours now, my friend. We can see it, uh, Victor. You're awfully hard to hear in the background. That's nice. Thank you for increasing fonts. Yes, I'm hard to hear in the background because I am uh, turned the wrong way from Greg's computer, which is our audio host for today. All right. So this is just going to be a very quick demo of our new secure params feature. Um, we don't have a UX around for it yet. That was a caught up in some debugging, so I didn't have time to fully stage the uh, demo, but I can still show off uh, how it looks via the CLI. So to start with, so we, have a, uh, we have a parameter that has the secure flags. And as you can see here, I made so it secure because I'm very inventive that way. And uh, one thing to note is that it has this secure flag. Yep. And what that means is that uh, you have to have new sets of permissions to be able to uh, add this parameter to any of the parameter carrying objects, uh, profiles, um, plugins, and machines. And you have to have a different set of, uh, a different set of uh, access permissions in order to be able to retrieve a decrypted value of the parameter once it is stored. Um, and with this, with set up this way, the parameter is stored in an encrypted fashion on the back end, and there is a separate uh, store for the uh, private keys that we use to allow you to, to allow the system to decrypt uh, the values. Um, and uh, one of the things that is slated for uh, kind of an, a feature improvement is to be able to allow you to um, store those private keys in vaults, but right now they're just stored in, you know, Shimad uh, 400 uh, files on the back end as a default option. All 
All right, so I'll go ahead and show setting this on something. Let's see. So we can see that we went ahead and added the parameter secure to the global profile uh, with the value of really secure, and it gave us back this uh, it gave us back this uh, encrypted structure. Uh, this is uh, what you would need to use to the API in order to actually uh, post values to the system. Um, and what that did on the back end is it uh, looked up the parameter, noticed that it was a secure parameter, looked up the public key that the global uh, profile exposes, encrypted that value with uh, with that public key and an ephemeral private key and uh, a nonce for non-replay back and uh, posted that data onto the global param. And it also validated that it was a, a string on the back end. And so now if we If we just get that uh, parameter without uh, passing any special options, we just get the encrypted value. And this is also the way it is stored on the back end. Uh, without the accompanying private key, which isn't exposed over the, which cannot be exposed over the API and uh, which only the back end has access to, this data is pretty useless. However, we can, since uh, I'm running as RocketScape, which has permissions to do everything, I can uh, decrypt it. So by passing the decode flag on the CLI, and we get back really secure. And so the way this would be uh, normally used in production, uh, you would add the values of the params um, via the CLI like I did here, make sure that the param has the secure flag set. And the only things that are allowed to decrypt um, Secure parameters are the template rendering engine whenever it is rendering a task because those are exclusively served to the task runner over HTTPS and the plugins whenever they are running because those are exclusively served over a uh, local Unix socket. And, you know, we might want to be able to do things like pass an IP my password to a plugin for it to be able to do its thing. And we do not want anything else to have access to the private keys that are used to decrypt these values. Um, I have plans on how to implement this uh, functionality similar to this, except using Vault to store the actual values instead of just the uh, private keys like, uh, like we currently do um, through a clever combination of console stuff and uh, using Vault to back some of console's key space. Um, but that is secure parameters in a nutshell. So um, that's awesome that, that we're laying in this groundwork because it's, it's definitely one of those features that helps enable um, secure and security sensitive deployments and enterprise deployment capabilities as well as those in the open source world that are looking to do some basic deployment capabilities and secure parameters. Um, so can we back step just a little bit and talk about um, what are some of the use cases driving this uh, feature and and what are we uh, looking to solve with the capabilities of the secure params? Sure. Um, the primary use case that springs to mind for me is storing people's IPMI passwords. Um, because for most IPMI controllers, you have to pass it a clear text password when you're authenticating with the IPMI tool or any other tool that talks to an IPMI controller. Yep. Uh, but you don't want uh, everyone who has access to the system to be able to see what the IPMI password is. So the way that uh, the permissions are set up is that only users that are authorized to, um, to update secure parameters have the ability to set the, up, set the IPMI password and only users that have uh, rights to uh, get secure parameters in a decoded fashion can see the clear text one if they pass the appropriate flag to the API call that fetches parameters. Um, 
Beyond that, the only things that it would have access to it are is, uh, a task that you write to poke the IPMI controller or the IPMI uh, plugin whenever it's going to power cycle a system or perform another action on behalf of uh, DR provision. Um, other use cases that are coming up, uh, being able to store uh, uh, private keys that, that we would use to be able to do an automated Kubernetes deploy, um, storing uh, SSH private keys if you uh, need to be able to hand those back and forth. Um, really storing any data that you don't want everyone who has access to the system to be able to see. I'm imagining also, uh, you, you mentioned the Kubernetes deploy side of things, but, um, but in, in general clusters that require a secure uh, secret or token to join cluster activity sort of pattern, that's a good place for storing those secrets that you don't want generally exposed. Uh, right. in any of your content. Right. Um, then, presumably also passwords that you might want to be passing into uh, Kickstart precedes or similar sort of provisioning activities where you have passwords, uh, passwords exposed. Well, hopefully you're passing in uh, pre-hashed passwords and not raw ones anyways. But yeah, that's another use for it. So how do, how do you make sure, it didn't look like you had to provide additional data when you retrieved it. How do you make sure that the person retrieving the decrypted data is legitimately the person who's supposed to get it? There is, uh, you have to be, able, you have to have a role that gives you access to be able to de to fetch de decrypted secure parameters. And I'm running as Rocket Skates as the Rocket Skates user, which has access to everything. Um, but that is another action that you can use whenever you're building out a role. Um, there are two new actions, uh, update secure, which allows you to set secure uh, parameters and uh, get secure, which allows you to get decoded values for secure parameters. Um, if you don't have, the, if you don't have uh, those access, you can't perform the respective operations. The API will shut you down with a 403. Excellent. So that's tying right back into uh, two weeks ago when you did meet up uh, with our back uh, tenant capabilities mm -hmm. and expands on the use case with the tenant and our back uh, controls and capabilities. Yeah, and I deferred. Uh, I, I've been working on secure parameters for a while before that, but I came to the conclusion pretty quickly that without some sort of our back uh, secure parameters wouldn't really be that secure. <laughs> Vaguely secure parameters. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, secure parameters take care of two different problems, right? One is um, storing stuff on the system in an encrypted fashion. So data at rest is secure, right? And, and encrypted. And then the other is controlling access to that data through the API at times where you need it and times where you don't. And that's where the RBAC stuff comes in. We're trying to address kind of both paths right now. Yeah. And there was a question in the community from Kat. Okay, well, let me stop sharing that way I can actually see it. <laughs> I can read it for you. Hold on a second. Uh, let's Wait. see. Did he post it to you? Uh, no, it went to everybody. It's, uh, he asked. Uh, Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, only held in memory. Okay, so Kat asked, uh, so they're only held in memory then? Um, no, the, secure, the, uh, the encrypted data is uh, written out to the store, just like everything else. Um, it's only written out in the encrypted uh, format like you could see on, on my screen when I was sharing. Though. Um, and the, uh, the private key that you would use to be encrypted is written into an entirely separate store. Um, which can live in an entirely different space or even be in, or even on an entirely different storage method. Um, currently the most secure option for that is to, for that is either a local directory which uh, has the appropriate mode bit so no one else can read it or um, or being stored in a, a, a part of a console key space that is backed by a vault. Uh, which yeah so that touches on some of the forward um, thinking features and capabilities we're looking at around highly available and enterprise sort of deployment uh, scenarios, uh, backing uh, data store in uh, key value services with console, HashiCore's console being one of the first ones we're looking at. Yeah. 
and that's uh, I, and I guess uh, so unless people are interested in getting into the uh, nitty gritty technical details like what kind of crypto am I using and that sort of thing. I'm more or less done with uh, the demo for secure params that I have now. I'm sure there'll be more over the on uh, upcoming uh, meetings when we actually uh, get a UX around it and flesh out use cases and get feedback from the community. And so, uh, Chris, uh, Kat on uh, community also asked about how that ties, that this might tie into Vault, which, um, Greg, I think you have a really good answer framed around that. Yeah, so as we go forward, uh, one of the thoughts is that we do console as a key value store, and Vault and console have a setup where you can create sub key spaces inside of console that will then be stored in Vault securely. So that way DRP thinks of it just as a key value space to get private keys, but to log in, it would have to access the vault. The vault would have to be unsealed. All of those things that you get from vault will continue to happen. That also enables us to begin to look at doing things like um, HA DRPs with DHCP failover or some other things like that, because we can use a uh, console as a shared uh, key value space, which is basically how uh, DRP stores its data today. Um, those two things kind of mesh together to become uh, a story for both HA and um, another, a next layer of secure parameters, right? There's always ways to go about doing this in more and more secure ways, right? You could eventually get to using an HSM module that had just it's crazy, yeah. Right. So, but the, the default implementation is a separate store in DRP that's written out to the to the local disk, right. managed in a separate space, right? Yeah. With the next step being a vault um, required to be unsealed kind of set of operations. Yeah. Um, yes. Chris, right. can you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Chris is asking. So what happens if it's in memory and stuff like that? And so yes, the decrypting occurs in memory and then either gets uh, and then gets sent over an HTTPS stream to the caller or streamed over that same HTTPS session as a template to get executed on the node in question. Um, yeah, we don't we don't keep we only keep we only have them in memory for as long as they're going to be used. So and. The so when, once they're served in a template, they're destroyed because the template's been served. Yep, correct. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and, and there are really crazy, in some regards, next level security things that we're not doing, um, and we probably won't because the overhead to value is low, and then it really ties you to Linux systems. There's actually some people who are doing memory fencing around secure loaded parameters so that you can make sure nobody touches them outside of your thread, outside of your process and other stuff like that. But um, yeah, my strategy is to make sure they're always allocated on the stack so they get wiped out as soon as the functions yeah. get returned. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's, there's that kind of stuff that we could do. Like if you actually look at Vault, Vault is doing some of that, right? Because its purpose is to do that level of craziness. Um, I'm not sure that's what <laughs> yeah. So. Anyway. Okay. All right. Okay. Excellent. Uh, any other questions from community or thoughts or comments around the secure params implementation uh, and how it ties in uh, with digital rebar provision and how we also touch the RBAC uh, tenant control capabilities with that. Chirp, 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 going once, going twice, going three times, we'll move on. And so that actually is, oh, we got a uh, Romain. Oh, Romain's waiting to play with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you'll need to. Definitely, you'll need tip because it's just just touched, hit tip. Uh, what was it? Yes, okay. Yeah. So lots of playing with it is good to help uh, shape the use case and potentially shake out any issues or 
questions around usage, uh, but you are gonna need to pull tip uh, for digital rebar provision and tip content as well when you pull tip. And then you'll need to talk to us about a license. Yes. <laughs> so that we can give you access to uh, secure yeah. parameters. Yeah, that's uh, one thing that I don't think we talked about for RBAC or for uh, secure parameters last week, um, is that these are uh, licensed features. If you uh, don't want to sign in to our, to our SAS and get a license, you uh, won't have access to these features. If you get the API, it'll say access tonight. So, but yeah, hit us up in the channel or send us email and we work on that. Right, we, can, we can generate development licenses trial POC test licenses yes uh, okay um, moving on uh, next we have on the agenda uh, actually continuing a little bit on the RBAC and tenant thread uh, Greg has been hard at work uh, dusting off his uh, react love and um, skills <laughs> and helping to plumb in some of the RBAC tenant uh, capabilities into the UX. Uh, and he's gonna give us a little bit of a tour of the tenant features and capabilities. For those of you who didn't uh, join us uh, last time on version 17 of the meetup, we talked uh, quite a bit. Actually, I think over the last two meetups, we've talked about it. Uh, two meetups ago, we introduced the concept of what we're doing around RBAC. Uh, and then we locked Victor into a small closet with his enormous laptop and for about two weeks or two and a half, three weeks. And he worked hard on uh, burning in the RBAC and tenant uh, capabilities. Uh, and then we also uh, discussed uh, or actually demoed uh, last meetup, uh, the CLI capabilities in RBAC controls. And Greg is now bringing some of those controls to us in the UX. Um, again, these controls around our back tenants are in the tip version of the UX. They have not yet hit the uh, stable portal, uh, portal.rackend.io. So you'll need to go to uh, tip or test.rackend.io, or you can click on the uh, lab um, beaker icon on your current portal.rackend.io, and that'll take you to the test version. Uh, with that, take it away, Greg. Okay, so in this episode of Oh My God, They Let Me Write a UI, <laughs> we will be looking at users, roles, and tenants. We kind of talked about them conceptually before. Reminder, a user is what you log in as. You can create a token for a user that will then let you log in as that. And then roles. Um, roles define uh, what you can do. Um, they can even somewhat limit what you do things to. Um, but the tenant function is intended to be that new level of operation of these are the sets of things you're allowed to do. Allowed to see. And allowed to see. Yeah, see. Ugh. So in this case, I have my, I'm logged in currently as Rocket Skates. Um, and I have my user Fred. I've given Fred super user capability. And right now, since I don't have Fred in the tenant, if I log in as Fred, He'll be able to do everything Rocket Skates can do. Um, some of the things we've added on the role side is you now have a UI that lets you drive and alter claims. So in this case, you know, the super user has a very wide reaching, do everything, you know, for everything on every action for whatever it is, you're able to do it. Um, you can create roles that are specific to certain things like this, this not see, uh, meant to be not much to see, I can't type. Basically limits the user who has this role to just seeing stages, but you can do anything to a stage if you, but that's it. Um, roles can be, have multiple claims. Um, claims can be star, 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 or claims can be for specific roles. You can even limit the roles to certain actions. Like I could say you could only delete roles or you could say even specifically, you could only delete roles, names, uh, if I could type, or apparently you can't type anything in that field. I gotta fix that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like we said, it's an evolving feature in the UX. So. Um, so I could save that, which would then 
let this role base this this role limit editing roles to where I could just delete any role. I'm not Can't sure why see you, want. you can couldn't see them, but you could delete them, and then still have the stages. The point is, you can build these up to restrict your actions. So this is how you might generate read-only views. So you could say, okay, I could change actions to just get list, um, and then that way they would only be visible. But that applies to all objects in the system. So to limit that, what we have is tenants. So with a tenant, you can define a subset. So um, I'm going to say subset one, and then I can assign a user to it. So I'm going to put Fred in this tenant. At this point, a user can only be in one tenant. And then what I can do is I'll add that. And right now I can see I have one user in it. I could have more, but right now Fred's in it. But subsets not really restricting, restricting any views. By default, the tenant lets you see everything. Okay. So now if I want to, I can say, okay, let me restrict my list to machines. So objects. And so now I have a choice. I can either say no list, which means there's no restrictions. You can see all machines in the system anywhere. And that's kind of how everything defaults. I can say empty list, which means nothing. You can see none of these types of objects. Okay. Or I can say um, a specific machine or sets of machines. So in this case, I can say, Fred, I'll let you do anything to the system, but you can only see um, machine Linux one. I could also go and say, okay, well, let me also restrict Fred to seeing the complete discover and none stages, right? So if I save this and then I can log out. So the UX has grown some new buttons to indicate what user you're in. So up in the corner here, you see what user you're logged in as. You can log out. So in this case, I'll log in as Fred. I'll try. Since I have restricted access, Fred can see his normal stuff. Except if I go to stages, notice I'm restricted to only seeing the same things Fred can see. And then if I go to machines, instead of seeing the two machines I have, I only see the one. So whenever Fred takes actions or does API calls, he will get a restricted set of data to operate on. So at this point, I can then come on and say, okay, strangely enough, Fred has the ability to edit his own tenants. But since he can only see the machines, he can't by default undo himself. So he can do that, save himself. Now when he reloads, he can see both machines. The point is when you build your roles, you might want to actually restrict access to like manipulating tenants and stuff like that. And roles too, <laughs> right? So, you know, create a new role called everything but tenant and roles, um, which I mean, I guess you didn't even have to do, right? So we'll do that. Add a claim. Um, Actually, maybe it's harder to do than I thought. Well, you are logged in as Fred. That's true. So if I log out again, defaults back in as rocket scoops. Hmm, something else is broken. Do the options. I'm supposed to get lists because I got lists before, so I'm not sure. Oh, that's right. Sometimes the tenant information doesn't always get updated appropriately. There we go. Whenever you switch users. So I'm going to go let Fred have access to everything. Hmm, I see a browser feature of select all coming soon. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so now if I do that, I get rid of that one and I say save. So now if I go give Fred, that, so Fred now shouldn't be able to see roles and tenants when I log in and he should have a restricted subset. So let me go back to my machines, change this to 
That is one problem I don't like with my UI. Don't ever click outside. And then if I log out again, this time log back in as Fred. Notice Fred thinks he can try and look at tenants, but he can't actually do anything with tenants. There's no data there. Oops. I missed. He can try and add, but it'll fail because he doesn't have permission. So um, you can always kind of see yourself. And that's the gist of the. Oh, I, did, I ended that. Yeah. yeah. So that's basically what's happening and how it works. Uh, actually, assuming it's all done correctly. But that's the gist of it. So using the log in, log out buttons, you should be able to switch between the two sets of, of users and see their content and see their memberships. Make sense? Clear as mud, I'm sure. Yes, indeed. Uh, any, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Romain asks in uh, chat, is it possible to hide menu entries if the role is restricted? <clears throat> or at least post a message this is restricted by your role, presumably would be a, an alternative to that. Hmm. I initially started out with that inclination, but throwing 403s instead of uh, 404s for a bunch of different things caused the UX to explode. Yeah. So right now, if you can't see something, you just don't see something, and you don't see an indication that you're not allowed to see anything. That's right. So. so currently, there's not an easy way to do that in the sense that we don't know what you're Right. From a security perspective, you don't want to tell somebody what they're not allowed or to do or not, because that's information to which they can then use to try and figure out how to get around stuff. Um, so instead, we just say, hey, you're, you can only see nothing. Um, so it's a little tricky to do that. Sorry. Right now. OK, it was just to uh, avoid uh, having people requesting that. Yeah, I don't have access to this, I need it. Just, yeah, this is your menu, click there, that's it. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, yeah, I get it. Uh, right now, I don't have a good way to do that. Yeah, no problem, just asking. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it even prevents you from seeing them, which is kind of, you know you're in it, but you can't see what it is to do which is kind of an interesting side effect. So anyway, that's kind of where we're at. Um, again, it's in tip and test UX as well as um, it's in um, tip DRP. And then you'll need to make sure you have a RBAC in, um, in your license and secure parameters in your license. Kind of it. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Greg. Uh, does that generate any other questions besides uh, Romain's around hiding uh, access vectors from community? Going once, going twice. Sold. Okay, excellent. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, and do a quick uh, bug scrub. Uh, I'm going to drive through. Oh, I should probably share my screen. Um, I have no idea which one to share here. La, 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 la. Uh, yes, that's the correct one. OK, so and everything moves around on me again. Thank you, Zoom. Uh, Hold on, I gotta find all my windows again.
Okay, excellent. Uh, all of these, uh, all of the issues uh, for enhancements and bug requests are typically uh, taken in for bound uh, via. Is that just my phone doing weird things, or I'm still on with you guys? We're good. All right. <laughs> My phone made a whole bunch of bleeping noises at me. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so all of the inbound feature requests and enhancements are taken in from the top level digital rebar provision uh, GitHub uh, issues. So uh, just hitting digital rebar provision and then the issues panel for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, we would love to um, uh, get any input, feedback. Um, if you run into problems, please file those there. <clears throat> that being said, uh, we're going to run through real quickly on some of the uh, features and enhancements that have been com that have come in uh, with current status. We've got a, a couple pages. We usually try and keep this room down. It's been a while since we've done a bug scrub. Um, let's see. Where do we want to start? Uh, we've go back to. Unit tests for token author authorization and authentication, uh, bug number something or other, 160. Um, I think this has been completed, Greg, uh, Victor, correct? Uh, adding uh, token auth and uh, authorization authentication tests. Yep, that's done. All the RMAC stuff is uh, pretty fully unit tested. Okay, and add unit tests for basic auth, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, I test uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. against like four different users with different. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're good now. We're good now. Yep. Uh, restrict auto generated tokens for machine ops. Nope. No, we're not on that one. Um, well, hang on. Go ahead and take a look at that. What is it? That's what is that called? IP address validation. Oh, yeah. We don't restrict that yet. Basically, the, this is a feature request to uh, limit machine tokens to the IP address of the machine that they are assigned to. Um, this works in most environments. We haven't done it because there's a few use cases that would get funky. In the sense that if you're going through a NAT or if you're going through um, some VPN tunnels and stuff might cause issues with this validation. And so. There's some, we had some use cases where people were wanting to do that. And so it's on our list, it would be really good, but we don't do it today. Okay, and so there was uh, issue 210, boot env preview. Um, and it's cousin to 211, um, they're not there. They don't, they don't do what, the person who wrote those wanted. Um, we have ways and fact entries to let you view them. If a machine's in that state, you can then use curl to get the templates and boot amps. But there was a request to do a preview of like in the UI, be able to pop up and say, hey, show me what my boot amp would render as um, if, it, if the machine and we're in this state, right? And we don't have that. Right. Ooh, that was 210 and 211 both, right? That's Which right. Uh, 211 was templates as opposed to boot ends generic. That's right. Um, I don't, I think the verify is mislabeled, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. We also have uh, 284. Uh, can add contain string function to the indexer, name equals contains Fred to match machines whose names contain Fred. Uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. awesome. We should do that. We have it. Basically, it would be a, it would be a, yeah, it's awesome. What? Reservation for two releases. Uh, reservations should not always use two hours for lease. Uh, assign that to me. Okay, so. <laughs> this we fixed that, yeah. right? So, so. Huh? We 
we've we finished we fixed this quite some time ago right no <laughs> there's a assign there's, it to me I'll, I'll make sure it gets fixed yeah okay it's a quick thing it's just all right uh, so that's assigned to you, Greg. Uh, clean up exploded ISOs. Uh, I know we have not done anything with this. Uh, still tracking one day to do a little bit of cleanup work with this. Yeah, that's 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 still tracking. Um, yeah, uh, most mostly because uh, adding that doing that cleanup will require uh, adding a new set of API tabs that. Uh, I don't see the utility of beyond just getting into the box and R and R I think whatever you don't want <laughs> at this point. Um, well, no, I, I understand why we would want it. It's just uh, hasn't been that high on my list of priorities. Okay, uh, and then uh, in four thirty eight, add example API endpoints should return YAML representation of the mode model in question to use as a template for operator documentation. Um, uh, thoughts are on this. Yeah, that's still on the that's still on the lower priority list of things to do. All right, and then we had in the UX we had uh, colorized content display or preprint stuff that is there for the most part. I think uh, everything has been done there. Uh, partially started by Isaac uh, at Meshiest and Greg. I think you finished up and added a bunch more uh, stuff in there. Yeah. Do we feel um, that we can close this? We can. Um, you opened it. Um, the one question that I think is still remaining is the templatizer or the uh, template editor doesn't do highlighting, I don't think. Um, yeah, because of the unique nature of what the content is versus the Golang template pieces, uh, yeah. we'd have to write custom uh, yeah. rendering components. That's right. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Kat. He asked if uh, the Swagger stuff has been removed. And the answer to that is no. I mean, no. <laughs> the Swagger <laughs> stuff is still there. Right. Probably even still works. OK. Oh, um, I'm not sure. I think what. Um, I think that the general uh, pretty print stuff is enough that we have. I think expanding it to the templatized stuff is something that will open as a separate issue going forward. If we want to do that. Yeah, let's do it that way. That's better. Uh, so re resizable content windows. Uh, this is one of those things. I think some of it's been done, but not all of it. Probably. There's probably other specific areas that need to be addressed. Um, some of the yeah, the big mass fields probably need to make sure they all are using the same object type. Or the, the field type. Okay, so it's resizable content windows. Go away. Uh, archive compression, I, uh, handling internally via Golang, not external packages. This has not been done yet. Uh, and then uh, enhance register endpoint management. Uh, list of registered endpoints grows as you add new endpoints. Created, deleted rapidly. Uh, So I guess last time we bug scrubbed in January on this one, we said it's fixed, but still buggy. Um, um, I don't think we've done any more work around that. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't tried it to see what's broken or not. It may be better. I don't know. I know Rob added some ability to do icons and other stuff like that. So. I... so. Okay, I'll leave it open for verification at some point when you're bored. Um, 
machine name beginning with number breaks provisioning. So this has popped up a couple times. Uh, we had a community member, I believe. We might yeah. have a separate issue open on this, but. Yeah, the, the main, it's easy to fix. Um, and at this point we probably should just fix it. And just remove that restriction from the name validator. Okay, so um, needs fixed. Uh, machine name, okay. Uh, UX add delete to the right side pop out panels in addition to edit. Uh, there's discussion on whether it's the right thing to do or not. Uh, um, yeah. It's doable, but it's, I don't know. I'm just going to mark it not going to complete. Somebody decides they want that going forward. We can reopen or open a new one. Uh, UX remove endpoints and rack and portal save button doesn't work. Uh, this relates back to the endpoint management stuff. I think in general. Yeah. So uh, I then reported that Chris trees piled in on it as well. We got all kinds of pretty pictures in this issue. Very nice. Um, so yeah, this uh, is still set to verify and we need to validate in addition to the other ticket. Um, I should have left open, but. Okay. Uh, and then we have contents need helper for DRPC live based content installed. Um, yeah. Ah, so yeah, so this is just automation of content install pieces and getting the appropriate content pieces from the automation library, I think. Yeah, I was against this. Um, but uh, maybe coming around. Yeah. All right. I see. I, I understand what this wants to do. All right. We're leaving open for consideration. Uh, test, sign up, login, and log out. Ah, this is Chris. Yeah, our, our unit test testing kind of facilities that we don't really have or use. All right, we're gonna leave open because we never really resolved the UI testing stuff, which Chris has offered to do some help with. Um, we're gonna leave it open for now. And we'll uh, re-add um, re that back into the work or into the process. Um, let's see, the theme switcher we don't need to do. I know the status of that one. That is a nice to have. I'm gonna leave it open though. Uh, but it's probably not going to get some work for a while. Um, content update community produces erroneous warning. Some dude named Shane filed this. Yeah, so uh -huh. this is better. Um, I remove the erroneous warnings part. <laughs> well, you get warnings now um, and errors, but they're the real ones. So, yeah. The, the or, and that's for content that um, has validated as missing component, components and pieces, right? For example, if you don't install Debian 8, Debian 9, and you have DRP content installed, you get warnings that those bootems are missing. That's right. And you'll still get those because those are still the warnings in the system at the time you did the upload. Um, and that's correct. Well, you were getting a warning, erroneous ones before where it was saying sledgehammer's not exploded even though sledgehammer was exploded. That's been fixed. Right. Uh, there's a different question of if you upload content, um, 
what is wrong with the content you uploaded only. And that's much harder. Um, so, because we don't currently like do a validation to get all the warnings that are currently in the system and then add the content and only show you the warnings or errors that were not already in the system. And right. that's how we do it, but we don't. Um, and so, I'm not sure the, uh, so this is better. I don't know if it's completely where the uh, opener wants it. Um, so I think that if the current set of errors or we, we believe are cleaned up and valid still uh, against the existing installed content and the error messages that were actually erroneous have been removed, we can probably close this. There is a further discussion about how much of that field is still useful, I guess. Um, it's, I mean, because it kind of pollutes the CLI output when you're working with CLI, uh, CLI and JSON output. Um, agree. I, I, I agree what you want. Um, I just haven't found a quick and easy way to do it. Probably the, the answer is a fact that says to delete the warnings, uh, field from your output, use JQ. <laughs> Yeah. All right, we're going to close that one. Um, uh, UX add jobs logs to machines and bulk actions machines. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what do we have there? In both the machines and bulk actions panels, it'd be nice to have an icon that clicks through to jobs of the machine UID filter applied, so you can quickly view jobs related to a given machine UID for these screens. Uh, uh, yeah, so I tested this in February and there's still um, some work to be done. So the UI has the fields as links to hop to the right places but they don't actually filter anything. So, okay, so, so there's still some more work that needs to be done here. Right. So if you were to say like select something and then click, um, at least how I view that should work. It doesn't currently. Okay. Uh, create return to endpoint button on content catalog. We do have a go home, um, which I think fulfills that requirement in the endpoint. Um, it is annoying that it, you jump back to the info and press pages and not to your previous page. We don't cache the uh, page on exit and the refer and send you back there. Um, yep. I, there's a work, there's a workflow there that needs some love. So. Yep. Uh, we're going to finish out these last three two issue, three issues, uh, and then we'll finish the rest of the issues offline from the meetup. Uh, we'll turn it over for a couple minutes for questions from community, if there are any, uh, and then wrap set things up. So we're not going to continue pounding on this past uh, time. Um, DR provision on Windows, Greg, I think you no. fixed that? DRPC Alive runs on Windows. DR provision okay. won't. And most likely never will, will. And so part of me wants to just leave this open as something people can find to say, don't ever do this. Yeah, it's not going to work until some things get fixed in the Go libraries that we use. Um, and since they're part of the standard lib, you know, good luck with that. Yeah, there's, yeah. And with the way plugins work with Unix domain sockets, that's a little tricky too. So, um, Windows, running DRP itself on Windows probably won't happen. Um, DRP CLI makes total sense to run on. It should run just fine as long as you're not trying to run it as an agent. Yeah, right. Okay, and Which one? Uh, <laughs> shut up, Chris. We're not gonna switch to COBOL. <laughs> uh, 
So register DRP events when node pixies and pulls pixie Linux kernel and init RD. So this came in from Will. Um, just one of the logging events. But we don't we don't do that. <laughs> Good idea, but we don't do it yet. All right. And there's and a whole, whole class of should we generate events for all the render kind of actions and abilities. Right. So the last one we're going to tackle for today uh, before chucking over to questions. Uh, <laughs> plugin, packet IP my add destroy API call to plugin actions. We've That's done. done. It. That's done. That's what I thought. That's done uh, in multiple layers and multiple create, layers. Destroy capabilities to the plugin. So the IPMI virtual box have the ability to create machines and delete machines and manage. I did, we have that in KVM as well? Yeah, KVM too, KVM test, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, that's it for today's round of bug scrub. We got through um, a bunch of them, close to, to half of them, uh, not all of them, uh, but close to half. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up with any questions or comments, uh, thoughts from, from community you wanted to fire off at the RACN team. Uh, now's your time to talk. Aside from Chris, who wants us to implement uh, in Rust. <laughs> Uh, so remains asking uh, any news on the curtain network config features, Greg. Yeah, that's so that's been behind some of the tenant and secure parameter stuff, and on my list um, on the the roadmap and the the near term roadmap, but we haven't quite gotten to it yet. The the thing I'm fighting with on that in my head is um, I want to abandon curtain completely, and so it's one of those: do I do Networking first and then re-implement it or just abandon curtain and fix it all. Mm -hmm. for, for those that you aren't aware, uh, the image deploy uh, plugin piece that allows us to deploy images, ironically, based on its name, uh, has some limitations around advanced networking config capabilities that we've run into in use cases in the field. Uh, and so um, what Greg is talking about is do we want to try and fix curtain or do we want to move to a rack and digital rebar provision uh, piece that does things natively in our framework as opposed to trying to use the external curtain framework? That's the struggle there. Any other questions? Remain, does that answer? I know it doesn't give you the answer you're we'll looking give you for. the correct answer of next week or anything. Sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> It'll be tomorrow. Uh, I got news, so it answered my question. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right. Well, two weeks from today, whatever the date that happens to be, I think that's June 5th, maybe. Uh, June 5th will be version 19. Uh, look forward to everybody's partic participation. As always, you'll be able to find uh, our agenda and meetup information on meetup.com and we post the uh, Google Docs page as well. Uh, thank you very much to everybody and community that turned out today and thank you to everyone from RackN. Appreciate all of your participation. That's a wrap for version 17, 18. 18, version 18. Cheers everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.